It's an allegory. Huh? What? Do I always begin conversations this way, huh? The gospel is repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on the cross to make remission of sins, to make an atonement for our sins. There is only one gospel to preach to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Greek is a Gentile. But when it comes on to the Muslim, the sons of Ishmael, the legitimate sons of Ishmael, the, there's only one gospel to preach. I myself have encountered Muslims before, mano y mano, and I've had the opportunity to witness and to speak mano y mano with Muslims before. And um, actually it was three. And being able to engage in conversation with these Muslims, mano y mano, man to man. And the Muslims that I have encountered, man to man, have been polite, cordial, forthright, asking good questions, engaging. No complaints, no complaints. It's not until you get online here that you will run into people calling themselves Muslims and are just as rude and foul as my dear friend from Blackpool. Uh, yeah, yeah, but man, mano y mano, man to man. Um, personally, the Muslims that I have encountered are nothing like the so-called Muslims that you will meet online that I have met online, okay? Nothing of the sort. And in witnessing on to Muslims, I have encountered the argument that they are exactly, and which is true, that they are of the lineage of the firstborn of Abraham. And hence, when you uh, look into their holy book, the Quran, uh, they even you know, go off of that, that they are the firstborn. And because of the firstborn, uh, they believe that they are entitled to the blessings of Abraham. But as those of us of the Church of the Living God, we know that it is in Isaac that your seed will be called. And in witnessing unto the Muslims, um, the three opportunities where I've had to um, to converse with these people and just to chit chat and to go through stuff and even go through some scripture. Um, that was something that always came up. Always something that came up. Very interesting. Very interesting. And as far as Islam is concerned, there is a lot of evidence out there that suggests that Islam is a daughter of Catholicism. Uh, Second, uh, Seventh day Adventist Walter Veith did a wonderful video on that. And also, uh, the testimony of Alberto, brother Alberto Rivera, here in, see, we're not going to look at this, but uh, also gives credence to that in his testimony. See, this is the one. So, yeah, there, there is evidence that suggests that Islam is a daughter of Catholicism. But, okay, but, I'm going to be answering a question that was, or kind of almost actually like an accusation in a way, posed by someone who was calling himself, or herself, you never know, a Muslim. The channel name was Truth Fears Da, D-A, Guilty. Um, a foul-mouthed individual. Very foul-mouthed. And this individual, whether it were a man or a woman, you, you never, you never know, um, you never know, uh, brought up onto me about Ezekiel chapter twenty-three. Okay. And this individual is like, you exgens, exgens, need to have the stones, and that's not the word that this individual used uh, to read Ezekiel twenty-three. Like okay, okay. That's what's the point? The argument is 
that in Ezekiel 23, apparently, and we're going to look at this, um, atheists, as well as people who are calling themselves Muslims, will say, due to what is written in Ezekiel chapter 23 here in the Authorized Version of the Scriptures, it proves that God hates women or vile or mean toward women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And, you know, interesting about, about that, um, in the Quran, the Quran, now, I'm, I, I've not studied this, I have read the Quran one time, that was it. I'm not going to try to even pretend that I know much about what is written in here, um, only that I have read this and there were some things I retained. But one of the arguments that you will run into with a Muslim is about they're the, the holy books, okay? The Muslim will tell you that all the Qurans are the same, that there are no deviations in the Qurans. That is a lie. I have had three copies of the Quran before. I've gotten rid of two of them. This one is the one I've kept, obviously. Um, that is not true, okay? That is not true. Not all the copies of the Quran say the same thing, okay? That's line number one, okay? They use, there, there are differences. They use different words for different words for different words for different words, okay? And see what the Muslim will do unto the Christian. They'll say things like, well, which Bible? Hey. And you wonder why, personally, I'm so adamant as referring to this as the scriptures, even though it says Holy Bible. Okay? But the Muslim will say, well, which Bible? Which one? You have, and this is true, there are, what, over 230 translations of the Bible out there, right? Right? But, number one, when a Muslim brings that up to you, okay, Number one, call them on it. Call them on it. Because, I'll give you an example, okay? Now, I'm, I'm not, I don't know all that much to know about uh, Islam, and I'm not even going to pretend to say that I do. I know what I have studied about Islam, and I know, that, and I know for certain that Islam does stem from Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of abominations, Okay? The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, okay? This I do know. So you go to the head of the snake, okay? But I want to show you something out of the Quran, okay? In the chapter, it's chapter 4, chapter 4, this one is called the women. This is called the chapter of the women. Um, and this is something that I have brought up to a Muslim before, Okay? In the Quran, chapter 4, there, verse 34, okay? Here, and here, let me, let me give you a, let me give you a gander at this, okay? Take a look at that, okay? This thing, this one here, is written in a style of the scriptures. It has these and thous and thine and ye and stuff in it like that. But see... <laughs> it's used inaccurately with when you read this when I when I read this uh, the usage of thee thy thine um, uh, ye and stuff like that the usage of it within this version of the Quran was inaccurate in places so that 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 gives you a gives you a clue but the Muslim that this truth fears the guilty or whatever, if it was a he or she, I don't know. Um, they were a jerk. That's that's for sure. Okay, that's for sure. But say that in Ezekiel twenty three uh, says that God hate you know is mean towards women, is hates women and blah blah blah. In the Quran chapter four, verse thirty four, and I've brought this up to a Muslim before. And his argument, 
about, you know, the Bibles. And it was like, hey, that's true. That's true. The one bad thing was at that time when I was able to speak with that Muslim, I was not corrected on the fact that, hey, find Bible in the scriptures. Biblos. Okay. Um, in the authorized version, find Bible for me. Oh, you're making a big... Oh, shh, shh, sh sh shut up, shut up. How many Bibles are there? Okay? How many Bibles are there? Well, it says Holy Bible right there. Yeah, yeah, it does. But within the text of the scripture itself, show me the word Bible. Are, are we going to hold to these standards or are we just going to use them when we see fit? Okay? But, the one Muslim, and at that time, I wasn't calling the scriptures the scriptures. I was referring to it as the Bible, okay? And hence that trying to go through that clutter with this Muslim. It was, it was an effectual conversation. It was a glorious conversation, actually. It was very nice. It was very nice. Um, I think headway was made between him and I, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, it was an argument that he brought up about the Bibles, and it's like, okay. Verse 34, in the chapter called The Women, chapter 4, okay, about your, um, about how you go to Ezekiel 23 to say that God hates women and stuff like that. And that God is, uh, thinks how, uh, low of women and God condones abusing women, okay? This is the Quran, chapter 4, verse 34. Men are the maintainers of women. With what Allah has made, some of them to excel other. Uh, with what Allah has made, some of them to excel others, and with what they spend out of their wealth, so the good women are obedient, guarding the unseen as Allah has guarded, and as to. Those on whose part you fear desertion, admonish them and leave them alone in their beds, and here it is, and chastise them. So if they obey you, seek not a way against them. Surely Allah is ever exalted great. Okay, now here I want to show you what I read. Okay, okay, verse 34, right here where my finger is, right here. Where my finger is, okay? That's what I read you. Okay, you see that? And to the top of the page right here, where this finger is, this finger is, th right here. This is the end of that verse, okay? So you can see it yourself, okay? You can see it yourself. All right? Now, upon looking into this, this word chastise, now what word, root word it is, I don't know. But, in some of the translations of the Quran, chastise in other translations, it says, beat them. And if you happen to be a Muslim who is worth your salt at all, you would have to agree to that. Because that's seen it myself. Okay? So, when a Muslim brings up to you that all Qurans say the same thing. <laughs> That's not true. I have seen with this verse alone, chastise, also rendered beat them. But of course, because, of course, because Islam, the evidence is strongly suggesting that it derives from Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them? Yeah. Yeah. And and also, too. And this is also um, parroted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Okay? Which we're not going to go through. But God, I want to share this with you, too. Now, in the fifth chapter, in the fifth chapter of the Quran here, fifth chapter which is called the food, and there are verses 78 on to verse 82 in the Quran. Okay, now here, this, I want to show you. And note the heading here. Note the heading here. 
Okay, right where my hand is. See that? Do you see that? Is that? Can you see that? Yeah, you can. You see what that says there? See that? Okay. Okay. And that's, that's verse 78. And we are going to read on to verse 82, which culminates in this, on this thing. So we're going to read this side here. And this is the end of it where my finger is right here. Okay. So check this out. Okay. If you can see that. Okay. Check that out. Okay. Right here is the end of it. Okay. This is what we're going to read. Hold on to your hats. Section 11 out of chapter 5 known as the food in the Quran. I, I don't know much about the Quran, but I can read English. Okay? Okay? Section 11. Christian nearness to Islam. And Mr. Webster, here, when he talks about heathen, he mention, makes a comparisons of how the Mohammedans worship the one God or one God. Mm. I recommend Mr. Webster's dictionary. Absolutely. It's the, obviously the dictionary that I use. We're going to be looking at it today. But do remember, dear, dear man, that Mr. Webster was fallible. This is infallible, and our Lord built in his own little dictionary in here. Okay? So, Christian Nearness to Islam, chapter 5 in the food, verses 78 on to verse 82. Those who disbelieved from among the children of Israel were cursed by the tongue of David and Jesus Son of Mary. Oh yeah, and within the Quran, <laughs> they worship Mary too. Yeah, yeah, I know they do. I know they do because they have a lot of they have a lot of respect for Mary. They have respect for Jesus, but he's not God. <laughs> Anyway, this was because they disobeyed and exceeded the limits. They forbade not one another the hateful things they did. Evil indeed was what they did. And you got to remember too, Islam is also replacement theology. Okay? But remember, remember the mother of all harlots and abominations of the earth. Islam stems from Catholicism, okay? Thou seest many of them debriefing, befriending those who disbelieve. Certainly evil is that which their souls send before for them, so that Allah is displeased with them, and in chastisement will they abide. And if they believed in Allah and the prophet Muhammad, and that which is revealed to him, they would not take them for friends, but most of them are transgressors. <laughs> Get a load of this. Get a load of this. Okay? Dear friends, Church of the Living God, you want to hold on to Christian, huh? Check this out. Thou wilt certainly find the most violent of people in enmity against the believers to be the Jews and the idolaters. Yeah, Islam, Muslims, of course, that Ishmaelic hatred of Isaac, okay? But do not forget for one moment that son of Ishmael can get saved today, okay? Absolutely. It's not caused when you run into a Muslim. It's no reason for you calling yourself a Christian to go get drunk, shout racial slurs out at them, and then go hide out in a bush and then beat one half to death with a baseball bat in a drunken stupor. Okay? Christian. Yeah. Yeah. There's no cause, no reason for us as the Church of the Living God to behave like that. A Muslim, just like a Jew, 
can get saved today. The same way that I got saved by our Lord Jesus Christ, the same way you, Church of the Living God, got saved as well. Okay? Thou wilt certainly find the most violent of people in enmity against the, the believers to be the Jews and the idolaters. Idolaters who worship the cookie. <laughs> and the, check this out. And thou wilt find the nearest in friendship to the believers to be those who say, We are Christians! That is because there are priests and monks among them and because they are not proud. Hey, find me monk within the authorized version of the script. Find me monk in a Bible. That is because... Here, where my fingers are. Okay, look for yourself. Can you see that? Okay. Oh, oh, there it is. First, okay. Can you see that? Hold on. Let me see. So you get a good look at that. Okay, it's right here. Pause that and read it. Priests and monks. I ask you. Who is so big about having priests? Oh, that'd be Jesuit priests, wouldn't there? And uh, who, who, <laughs> who calls themselves Christians and have, have monks? Get, come on, come on. Who, who? Catholicism. My dear Muslim friend, just as with us Gentiles as well, which you are, okay? You are a half-breed of Shem and Ham, okay? Just like Timothy was a half-breed of Shem and Japheth, okay? You can be saved. There will be a link in the description box where you and I will reason together, okay? And if you are any thing like the Muslim people that I have encountered mano y mano. You would find it interesting. Unless you are these disputatious devils like this truth fears the guilty individual was. Okay? Your religion, dear friend. Sip. Seek the evidence yourself. Is derived from Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And who is that? Roman Catholicism, Satan's Church. Okay? Now, enough of that. Let's get to the topic at hand. Okay? Get your authorized version of the scriptures. And go to Galatians. What? I thought it was in... Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. <laughs> it's an allegory and you know reading something there's something called context and reading the entire chapter okay Galatians chapter 4 we are going to be reading from verses 22 uh, actually, let's read from verse 19 on to verse 31 in Galatians chapter 4. Please, follow me along in the scriptures. Hey, hey, okay? If you don't have the authorized version of the scriptures, please listen, and Lord willing, um, I will do my best not to trip up on anything I say, okay? Don't use a Bible. Get the scriptures, okay? Please, and follow me along. Galatians chapter 4, verses 19 on to verse 31. Follow me along. Come on. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, 
Do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, and the, uh, by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman, Hagar and Sarah. Okay, Hagar was an Egyptian of Ham. Sarah was a Shemite of the Hebrews, because remember, unto Abraham, who was at first Abram, the title, the name Hebrew was ascribed to him, okay? So the Hebrew line is derived from Shem, because God chose Abraham, and you Muslims out there even will admit that, that God chose Abraham. But see, God also chose Isaac, and Isaac will, okay? And Isaac is your seed called, okay? All right? Even though Ishmael is the firstborn. But, okay? For it is written, verse 22, again, that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, uh, Hagar, the other by a free woman, Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman, Ishmael, was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman, Isaac, Sarah, was by promise. Now, verse 23 right there is a cut and done dry deal. That explains it perfectly. What does this mean? When you read the accounts of God's promise that from your loins an heir will come, okay? Instead of waiting on God, Abraham as kind of egged on by his wife, Sarah. Sisters, take note of that. What not to do, okay? Sarah went to Abraham with her handmaiden. It's like, here, take my handmaiden, Egyptian, and go, on to, go in unto her and have children that uh, I could have children or something like that, okay? That is the account in Scripture. See, God made a promise to Abraham that an heir of his own loins would be born of Sarah. But see, they took it upon themselves to bring about the promises of God. So when Paul, Paul here says through the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that spirit, the Holy Ghost, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Father, who wrote the scriptures through man, okay? But he who is of the bondwoman, Hagar the Egyptian, was born after the flesh, meaning they took it upon themselves to bring about God's promises. And what has that produced? Hmm? I'm not Jewish. I'm not a Hebrew. I have seen with these two eyes, well, right now, four eyes, the Ishmaelic hatred towards Isaac. I've seen that. It's pretty scary. It's pretty scary. It really is. It, it, it truly is. It truly is. But, see, Abraham and Sarah, they took it upon themselves, not waiting for the fulfillment of the promise of God to come upon themselves from him, but they took it upon themselves. They's like, okay, you said you're going to bless someone, that I was going to have an heir. It's like, okay, fine. Okay, what are you waiting for? I'm going to do it myself. Okay? As egged on by his wife, Sarah in truth, okay? But it's in Isaac, the son of promise, which is a type in that aspect, is a type of Christ, the promised Mashiach, okay? The savior of Israel, the savior of the Jew, who is also the savior of the world, okay? But see, you got to come to him on his terms, not your own, okay? We've talked about that before on many occasions. Not going to get into it now, okay? Verse 24, Verse 24, here we go. Which things are an allegory. It's in the scriptures, yes. The word allegory is in the scriptures. For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. And it was upon Mount Sinai. Horeb, which some atheists like to point out, it's like, uh, well, the, the Bible can't make up its mind if it's Sinai or Horeb. 
one and the same. Okay, but never mind about that. Okay, verse 24 is talking about where it says, The one from Mount Sinai which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. It was on Mount Sinai where it received the Ten Commandments. Okay, the law. The law, okay? For this cigar is Mount Sinai, verse 25, in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, God's chosen city, which is which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So, right there, what is an allegory? Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. When he's describing Hagar and the child of Hagar and the child of Sarah. The child of Hagar, Ishmael, born of the flesh, born by them taking matters into their own hands, while Isaac, the son of promise, was the gift of God. So an allegory is using them to describe the two covenants. Okay? That's what the allegory is. It's an allegory. It's a figure of speech. Okay? Using, let's look at verse 24 again. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. So he's using the bondwoman of the, uh, the bondwoman and the free woman as an allegory to describe the law and what we have today, the two covenants, one of works and one of promise. Okay? That's what that is. That's what an allegory is. Okay? It's an allegory. And if you read scripture, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, he, he uses quite a bit of allegory within scripture. Okay? It's not uncommon. Okay, let's continue now. Verse 27. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the de desolate hath many more children than she which hath an hundred. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. See, because if you do something to bring about God's promises, you're doing it on your own and you have somewhat to glory, right? Because this is what you have done. But if it comes to you by promise of the Lord, who gets all the glory? Okay? Allegory. It's an allegory, dear friend. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. And oh boy, those who are after the flesh, you're, you're saved because you say you are. Those who are after the flesh who worship the skin suit, what do they do? But, he, as, but as then, he that was born after the flesh, taking it upon yourself, you save yourself by your own belief. Uh, uh, born after the flesh. Oh, I'm a good person. There was a reason why God died for me because there's something good in me. Born after the flesh. You gave up all this stuff. Don't touch. Taste not. Handle not. <laughs> But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. At this very day, at 12.54 p.m., my time here in Woodstock, Illinois. That is how it is right now. Those who are after the flesh, Catholics, Muslims, oh, and all, name them. Those that are after the flesh hate us that were born of the Spirit, which Paul calls us in verse 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Okay. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? 
cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Why? Because the son of the free woman, Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, was by promise, by grace, not by works, which is entitled to debt, that God owes you something. Okay, this, this is actually pretty basic stuff here. Okay? And it says to cast, the, cast out the bondwoman and her son. See, the works that the scripture talks against for salvation are the works of the law. We don't save ourselves by anything. We come to him on his terms, broken of our self-righteousness. See, when someone is saved by their own belief, you're saved by something you do, by your belief. Okay? I. How come you can't figure this out? I'm not talking to lost people. I'm talking to hairy ticks. Okay? I know why you can't figure it out, because you're lost devils. I get that. I get that. But, eh. Okay? See... The works of the law are what are talking, uh, spoken against, especially in Ephesians chapter 2. And in Romans chapter 3, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Okay? And see, when you got some putz who saves himself by his own belief, um, you're justifying your flesh by something you have done. I have no respect for easy believism. No respect whatsoever, just so you know, okay? So then, brethren, verse 31, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Cast it out. Cast it out. Cast out all your works for righteousness' sake. You're saved by your own belief. And come to the Lord broken on his terms. Having sorrow that it's your fault. See, a saved person doesn't go around blaming other people for what they've done. That's what lost people do, young man. Okay? But we looked at this because allegory is mentioned. The only time it appears in Scripture, right here. And it's a figure of speech, uh, basically replacing one thing for another to make a figure of speech to explain something. Okay? But now, let's go to good old Webster, shall we? Don't, don't worry, we're going to get to Ezekiel 23. Hold your horses, tough guy. Okay? Hold your horses, all right? <laughs> Besides, I, I, I know about the Muslim argument about, uh, what was that? In uh, the women, chapter 4, verse 34, about how it says chastise. I've encountered it. Okay? I've seen it. Chastise is rendered in other versions of the Quran as beat them. Okay? So don't let a Muslim tell you that all Qurans say the same thing. They certainly do not. Okay? Well, your Bibles don't say all the same thing either. You're right. You're, bravo, you're right. I don't read a Bible. It says Holy Bible on there. Oh, yes it does, but... Find me Bible within the text of Scripture. And within the text of... Scripture. You ought to do a word study on the word Scripture sometime. Very illuminating. <laughs> very. Very. Helped me to drop the word. Okay, but let's look up allegory and our good old friend Noah Webster's. There's actually quite a few um, variations of this. Okay. Um, Allegory within Webster's 1828 Dictionary. We saw the definition in Scripture first. That's all we really need. But to be thorough for you, let's do this. And um, what is it? A legend, then allegoric or allegorical. Adjective, in the manner of allegory, figurative, describing by resemblances. That's allegoric, okay? Allegorically, adverb, in a figurative manner by way of allegory. Allegoricalness, <laughs> noun, the quality of being allegorical. 
allegorize, allegorize, verb transitive, to form an allegory, to turn into allegory, as to allegorize the history of a people, Campbell. Kind of like what our Lord does in certain places, which we're going to see in Ezekiel chapter 23, okay? Okay, and a second definition for allegorize. Two, to understand in an allegorical sense as when a passage in, as when a passage in a writer may be understood literally or figuratively. He who gives it a figurative sense is said to allegorize it. Uh, allegorize again, verb intransitive, to use allegory as a man may allegorize to please his fancy. Allegorized. Allegorized. Principle passive. Turned into allegory or understood allegorically. Allegor allegorizing. Participle of, participle of the present tense turning into allegory or understanding in an allegorical sense. Allegory. Noun, a figurative sentence or discourse in which the principal subject is described by another subject, we just saw that in scripture, okay, resembling it in its properties and circumstances, which we just, we just read God's word, the scriptures, which basically, which said that, which says this, okay? I love the work that Noah Webster did. Praise the Lord that we got a, a good dictionary. But remember, dear friend, um, Mr. Webster is not infallible. This is. Okay? Let's continue. The principal subject is thus kept out of view, and we are left to collect the intentions of the writer or speaker by the resemblance of of the secondary to the primary subject. Okay? Which things are an allegory because the, they are the two covenants. Okay? Okay? Allegory is in words. The hieroglyphics... Allegory is in words what hieroglyphics are in painting. That's a good way to describe that, actually. We have a fine example of an allegory in the 18th Psalm in which God's chosen people are represented by a vineyard. The distinction in scripture between a parable and an allegory is said to be that a parable is a supposed history and an allegory a figurative description of real facts. That's a good definition, actually. An allegory, an allegory is called a continued metaphor the following line in Virgil is an example of an allegory. Claudite jam rivos, puree sat prata biberont. Stop the currents, young men. The meadows have drank sufficiently. That is, let your music cease, and our ears have been sufficiently delighted. It's actually a very good definition of allegory, and to be honest with you. But, okay, we've, God has defined allegory for us, and Mr. Webster has also defined allegory for us, okay? Now, let's go to Ezekiel 23. Ezekiel 20. Atheists will use this, and I was, I was, at first when this guy was doing this, or woman, you never know, I was, uh, I was like, well, what's your point? Then, ah, oh, really? 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 Yeah, yeah. Ezekiel 23. Now, here is the, if I, if I can get there. <laughs> Ezekiel 23. Now, the main thing that these guys like to attack is basically verses 20 on to verse 23. But, we are going to begin reading, oh, let's see, we are going to begin reading 
from verse, let's go to verse 18, on to verse 27, okay? Ezekiel 23, verses 18, on to verse 27. So she discovered her whoredoms and discovered her nakedness. Then my mind was alienated from her, like as, man, like as my mind was alienated from her sister. So, this, this twit Muslim individual, truth fears the guilty, is like, see right there, did your own scriptures say that God hates women. Esther and Ruth. Hmm? And you're calling yourself a Muslim, right? Hmm? Yeah, and yet you guys worship Mary. Hmm. That's interesting, I find. But let's continue, okay? Yet she multiplied her whoredoms in calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she hath pl had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. See, God has a problem with harlots, with prostitutes. Well, yeah, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, which is Roman Catholicism. Yeah, he's going to destroy it in Revelation chapter 18. But, you know, what about Gomer in Hosea? And uh, those who, the woman Mary Magdalene and stuff like that? The harlots and the publicans will come to the kingdom of God before the religious Pharisees would. Okay? Okay? No, no, see, you devils, you're twisting something and not telling people things that they need to know about the context and what is allegory. Okay, let's continue. Here's the big ones in question. For she doted upon her paramours, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses and whose issue is like the issues of horses. Gotta, gotta bring this up. Go to Psalm, not Proverbs, brother, Psalm 39. This, this is uh, very interesting. Very interesting. Psalm 39. Psalm 39, verse 9. Oh, no, no, no. Psalm 32, excuse me. Psalm 32, verse 9. Okay? Psalm 32. Let's read verses 8 and 9. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eyes. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, no departing from evil, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Hmm. Hmm. The ox knows his uh, master's crib and the ass knows his owner or something like that in Isaiah chapter 1. But my people do not know, nor do they consider. Mm. It's a frightful thing when the Lord is comparing you to a horse or an ass, which need to have their mouths held in with bit and bridle. Mm. Kind of like they're in bondage to something. Mm. Let's continue in Ezekiel chapter 23. And noting in verse 20, For she doted upon her paramours, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses, and whose issue is like the issue of horses. Thou, thus thou callest to remembrance, remembrance the lewdness of thy youth, and bruising thy teats by the Egyptians for the paps of thy youth. Therefore, O Aholabah, Oh, your God is really mean to this Aholabah. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee, from, from whom thy mind is alienated, and I will bring them against thee on every side, the Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekod and Shoah and Koah, and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses. Oh, yeah, God really has a problem with women, doesn't he? It's an allegory. Yeah, wait for it. And they shall come against thee with chariots, wagons, and wheels, 
and with an assembly of people, which shall set against thee buckler and shield and helmet round about. And I will set judgment before them, and they shall judge thee according to their judgments, leaving them, uh, leaving these two women over to the judgment of those who judge them, the, uh, to the Babylonians, uh, leaving them to their captors, leaving them to their own devices, leaving them to their just rewards, which they have so much earned. Oh, yeah. Yeah, God really has a problem with women, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. And I will set my jealousy against thee, and they shall deal furiously with thee. They shall take away thy nose and thine ears, and thy remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and thy residue shall be devoured by fire. Wow, God's really mean to women, isn't he? They shall also strip thee out of thy, out of thy clothes, and take away thy fair jewels. Thus I will make thy lewdness to cease from thee, and thy whoredom brought from the land of Egypt, so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt any more. Wow. Wow. So yeah, if you just read that, see, your God has a really big problem. He's mean towards women. He's mean toward prostitutes. What about Gomer and the uh, women who our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, touched? Yeah? No, 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 but this is it, right? It's an allegory, genius. I'll prove it to you. Now, we started at verse 18. Let's start at verse 1, shall we? Come on. It's an allegory. And to, much, to whom much is given, much is required. You read in the Torah, in Deuteronomy especially, and in Leviticus. The Lord, you know, how... His mercy is to, to those who obey him and those who disobey him. He is a jealous God. He doesn't want those whom he has chosen, his creatures, to go worship Satan. Okay? Okay? To whom much is given, much is required. Okay? We've covered this uh, in many videos before. But for the sake of this argument, okay, let's begin at verse 1 in Ezekiel chapter 23. Word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. This is an allegory, okay? We've defined it through Webster and our Lord uh, himself through the scripture has even defined it for us to read, okay? So let's continue. Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, and they committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breasts pressed, and there they bruised the teats of their virginity. And the names of them were Ahola the elder, and Aholabah her sister, and they were mine. And they, and they bare sons and daughters. Thus were their names. Don't look at me, look at the scripture. Samaria the northern kingdom of Israel and the, uh, the divided kingdom from um, King Solomon, okay? Samaria is a hola and Jerusalem a holaba. Let's read that. Thus were their names. Samaria, a nation, Israel is a hola and Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Judah, and Benjamin, okay? The divided uh, kingdoms of Israel, northern Israel, and southern, uh, the northern kingdom, and the southern, is, uh, southern kingdom, the southern kingdom, Jerusalem, Judah, and Benjamin were there, and all the rest of the ten tribes uh, were there in the northern kingdom. Not in England, you dolt, okay? Okay? All right, let's continue. Now, Samaria is a hola, and Jerusalem is a holaba. So Israel and Judah, the nations, the separated kingdom. It's an allegory, dear friend. Let's continue, though. And a played the harlot 
when she was mine, and doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors, which were clothed with blue, captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. Thus she continued her whoredoms with them, with all them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted. With all their idols she defiled herself. See, the whoredom that is being talked about is God's chosen people defiling themselves with idols, with idolatry, with paganism and stuff like that, okay? That's, that's the whoredom that is being used allegorically here in Ezekiel chapter 23. Okay, let's continue. Thus she committed her whoredoms with them, with all them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted, with all their idols she defiled herself. Okay? Neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt, for in her youth they lay with her, and they bruised the breasts of her virginity and poured their whoredom upon her. Wherefore, I have delivered her into the hand of her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians upon whom she doted. And we just read that about how he's going to turn them over. What was that in verse, uh, uh, verse 24? Compare verse 29 and verse 24, okay? These discovered her nakedness. They took her sons and her daughters and slew her with the sword. And she became famous among women. For they had executed judgment upon her. And when her sister Aholabah, and who is Aholabah? Jerusalem, Judah, the southern kingdom, okay? And when her sister Aholabah saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate love than she, and in her whoredoms, more than her sister in her whoredoms. She doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, captains and rulers, clothed most gorgeously. Kind of like the uh, woman in Proverbs chapter 7. Yeah. Horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw that she was defiled, that they took both one way. See, this is an allegory, dear friend. Our Lord is speaking in an allegorical sense to describe the paganism uh, influence upon his chosen nation, his chosen people, the Hebrew, Israel, the Jews. Okay? It's an allegory. Okay? This is allegorical. Okay? Our Lord is speaking in allegory. Okay? This is what this means. All right? Verse 14. And that she increased her whoredoms. The whoredoms is defiling herself with idols, going after paganism and stuff like that. Okay? For when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion, girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, all of them princes to look to, after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them and sent messengers unto them into Chaldea. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredoms. And she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. So, Samaria, Israel, okay, northern Israel, the northern kingdom, is a whole lot. Jerusalem, Judah, it's a holaba. It's an allegory. It's an allegory. God does not hate women. Woman was made for man, not man for woman. Okay? Yes, God hates sin. God hates harlotry. But a harlot, a prostitute, as you were, the modern phrase, can get saved today. And I know of a dearly, dearly beloved sister, a dear sister, who has confided in me that she was once a harlot herself. Okay? 
So a harlot can be saved today. Okay? A harlot can be saved today. Our God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ does not hate women. Okay? So when you run into this, dear brethren, Church of the Living God, be aware. If you, I've run into this by, by an individual claiming to be a Muslim, talking about Allah. Truth fears da, D-A, guilty. That was the channel name, okay? And this was their argument, that our God hates women. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Oops. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. See, devils will use rhetoric, will use philosophy, will use man's wisdom to try to persuade you that they are something that they are not, that they are spiritual. Yeah. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, perfect, saved with our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, saved by him, new creatures in Christ Jesus, whose hearts are perfect with him. Yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. And who is the prince of the power of the air? But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, capital S. For the Spirit teacheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And remember, God is a Spirit. Okay? For what man knoweth the things of man save the Spirit, lowercase s, of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the capital S, Spirit of God. The Spirit of man. What is the Spirit of man? Before our Lord comes into that man and saves him, seals him, the Spirit of man is what? The spirit of this world. Okay? Now we have received not the Spirit of the world. I should have shut up. Sorry but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know, excuse me, the things that are freely given to us of God, which things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You're of the church of the living God, saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus. You have God within you. How many times do I got to tell you this? You know this. Bear with me, okay? That seal until the day of redemption, once saved, always saved. That circumcision made without hands, okay? You have God within you. So comparing spiritual things, God that is within you, with spiritual things, the scriptures, okay? Because like he says in verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified, who saved that's what he determined to know. Who, who, who truly is of the church of the living God? Who is of the church of God here? Who truly is saved? That's what he wanted to know. Okay? 
Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the, the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And even the polite, courteous, forthright Muslims that I have encountered, mano y mano, every single one, able to converse with them, have good conversation and discussion, going through scripture and stuff like that. Wonderful, wonderful time of witnessing and testimony. Amen. But at the root of it, which I kind of said to him too. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. See, a Muslim is a natural man. A Muslim does not know what Allah will do with them um, when they die. They can hope for the best. Just like with Catholicism, you can hope for the best. <laughs> Good luck. Okay? But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. How? By searching the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You got to also to remember, dear brethren, about what it says in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Go there, please. James chapter, not the index. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. My fingers will get there. <laughs> James chapter 3, verses 15 on to verse 17. Ah. Uh, Let's begin at verse 13 on to verse 18. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. This truth fears the guilty that I encountered was just that. Bitter, envy, and had strife. Just like a lot of the devils that I encounter here on YouTube and elsewhere outside our door. Okay? This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And you know what? You tie that in to go back to Galatians chapter 4. That's a very good tie-in right there. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 12. Uh, where, where were we? Yes. Yes. Where is that? Galatians chapter 4, verses 21. On to verse 31 again. Tell me, ye therefore, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which flesh is. Which flesh is. A religion of flesh is always bondage. Which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which, is, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. 
in James chapter 3? But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work, noting flesh. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown, is sown in peace of them that make peace. Go back to Galatians chapter 4. Picking up at verse 26. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so is it now. James chapter 3, verse 15, on to 18 again. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, of them that make peace, as it's given to us by promise, not by things we do, right? Verse 28 in Galatians chapter 4. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so is it now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. See, it's an allegory. It's an allegory that is described, that's being talked about in uh, Ezekiel chapter 23. It's an allegory. But see, brethren, it's not our responsibility to explain every single thing unto people who ask of us. We are to give a reason of the hope that is in us, yes, but we are not to engage or to answer every single, because I, I've, I've done this myself. I've had emails where I've written 10-page dissertation explaining something. Just come back, well, what about this? Well, what about this? What about that? I've, I, we explained it. I explained it to you. They keep coming. They keep coming asking foolish and unlearned questions. These are the ones you need to avoid because they have no interest in learning truth. They're just asking questions to be disputatious. See? And you know, brethren, with some of these people, they can have a lot of knowledge taught by the wisdom of men, the wisdom of Jesuits, yes. But remember, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Okay? you got to remember that. I have to remember that. Praise the Lord, I'm, he's allowing me to get a lot better at that because um, I still get lots of questions. But um, And, you know, I answer them, you know. And if it's something too complex, a video is made. But, um, you know, brethren, the truth is out there. And it is not our responsibility, like I said, to explain every nook and cranny, okay? These people have to look for their own, okay? We are here to kind of like, it's like, oh, here, here. Where are you sending them? To our Lord Jesus Christ through the scriptures. The scriptures. Our Lord Jesus Christ through the scriptures. That's, that's where we lead them, okay? Please keep that in mind. And like I said, when you encounter some of these atheistic Muslims or whatever using these ridiculous arguments about Ezekiel 23, about how God hates women and stuff like that. Um, point out that it's an allegory. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Then read the very first verses 
beginning at verse 1, I should say, in Ezekiel 23, verses 1 under verse 4. So it's like, it's an allegory, man. That's what it is. That's what it is. You're just being disputatious. You have no desire for truth. So. That's going to be it for this kind of impromptu video. Um, uh, hopefully this will help a couple of you if you encounter some of this. I mean, these... <laughs> When I first encountered this by this individual, I was at first was like, dude, what are you dude, what are you talking about? Like, oh. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Okay. And like I said, with the thing here in the Quran about how it says chastised, um, and in some versions of the Quran, which I have seen, says beat them. So that's going to be it for this video. That's going to be it for this video. As you can see, a quick video. Um, today is Sunday, the 16th. Uh, brethren, please, please do keep us in your prayers. Um, the 24th, my wife and I, well, my wife is going to have an MRI. And we're going we're gonna to officially find out what we already know. And that will not be spoken of until it actually happens, but we already know, you know. Things have been getting a little rough around here lately because of such things. So please do keep us in your prayers. Please do keep us in your prayers. Um, Lord willing, we are going to be having company next week. So this might be the, um, this might be the last video for a little while. For a little while, because while well, we have company over here, um, you know, chance of fellowship and just to be with one another and whatnot. Um, I'm talking about our best friend, Alexander Hartley, may be joining us here. So while, of course, while we have company, i um, going to be, you know, having fellowship, hopefully getting out to do some tracting too, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's what's coming. But uh, anyway, wanted to get this done. Praise the Lord. Hopefully this helps some of you. Sorry if this was kind of stumbling and bumbling. Uh, I got just a bunch of notes. Just wrote this out. This was very impromptu. Uh, so hopefully this helps some of you. Thank you so much for watching this. If you do, we love you. We will see you in the next video.